At the third stroke, the time sponsored by Accurist will be 2.49, precisely. How does BT know the time? They do because they check their clock with one of the National Physical Laboratory's atomic clocks here in Teddington. The National Physical Laboratory maintains UK standards of measurement not only of time, but for physical quantities such as mass, length and temperature. And it works with organisations in other countries, so there's an international system of measurements. NPL carries out thousands of calibrations for measurement and instrumentation companies, manufacturing industry and others. All measurements are traceable back to the national standards. We're going to look at thermometers. Now, temperature is very important in lots of different applications. So people have developed thermometers that are well suited to each particular application. You've probably seen thermometers like this. This is a liquid and glass thermometer. This one's got alcohol in that's been coloured red, so you can see it. This is another liquid and glass thermometer. This one's got mercury in, and it's capable of slightly more accurate results. There are liquid and glass thermometers that'll record the maximum and minimum temperature. There are medical thermometers, so perhaps your parents have measured your temperature with something like this. Or maybe the doctor has stuck something like this in your ear. There are thermometers that will measure the temperature of things without touching them at all. This is a tiny little one. It tells me the temperature is 25 degrees. This one can, me this one <laughs> can measure the temperature of a pipe. It wraps around the pipe to uh, measure the temperature of whatever's flowing down it. This one is designed to measure the temperature inside a vat of something quite hot. And then there are electronic thermometers. This one's a thermocouple thermometer, and it measures the temperature just at the tip of this wire. If I touch it, you can see it shoot up very quickly as it quickly takes the temperature of my fingers. And this one is what's called a platinum resistance thermometer. And I'll be telling you about that in just a few minutes. Now all these thermometers that we've seen all look very different, but they all have something in common. They all have a physical property which changes with temperature. And we call them a thermometer because we're able to measure that change in a physical property and interpret it as a change in temperature. I'm going to look at two of these thermometers in more detail. I'm going to look at the liquid and glass thermometer and the platinum resistance thermometer. Now the liquid and glass thermometer has got a bulb of liquid at the bottom. And when the temperature increases, mercury expands up a very fine capillary tube. I'm going to place it in some hot tea I've got here. And you should be able to see it moving up. Now let's place it in some cold tea, which has been kindly provided for me. And you should see it moving down if I hold it in just the right position. Let's look now at the platinum resistance thermometer. As its name implies, this device measures the electrical resistance of a small resistor in the tip of this probe. If I place it in the hot tea, you can see the indication goes up. The device is detecting that the electrical resistance of this sensor in the tip of the probe has gone up and it interprets it as a change in temperature. If I place it in the cold tea, you'll see that the indication goes down. That's because the device has detected a fall in the electrical resistance of the sensor and interprets that as a fall in temperature. So although these two thermometers look very different, they're both measuring a change in a physical property then we interpret that as a change in temperature. Let's look more closely at the platinum resistance thermometer I showed you earlier. Now, inside the tip of this probe 
is a small sensor. I've got one separately here. Uh, I've taken out of its probe. Now inside this sensor is a coil of platinum wire and its electrical resistance depends on the length of the wire, the diameter of the wire and an intrinsic property of the platinum called its electrical resistivity. Now I have it wired here to an ohm meter directly so you can see the display in ohms and you can see if I place this sensor into a cup of hot water its electrical resistance rises. If I place it into the cold cup, its resistance falls. In the thermometer itself, this change in resistance isn't shown directly as ohms, but rather is converted through a calibration process into a display of temperature directly. NPL receives thermometers from all over the world to calibrate. Karen's just calibrating a liquid and glass thermometer against two standard platinum resistance thermometers. In order to compare the thermometers fairly, all the thermometers are placed in a bath together and Karen waits until all the thermometers have come to a stable temperature. Then the bath temperature is set to rise slowly and Karen reads the thermometers in sequence First, the platinum resistance thermometer. Then, using binoculars, she reads the liquid and glass thermometer to about a tenth of a scale division. Then, the second platinum resistance thermometer. Then, the liquid and glass thermometer. And finally, the first platinum resistance thermometer again. Then she repeats the whole procedure. Finally, the results are checked and collated and a certificate is produced and sent to the customer showing any differences between what their thermometer indicates and what the standard thermometers indicate. When customers send their thermometers to MPL, we calibrate them against our standard platinum resistance thermometers. But how do we calibrate our standard platinum resistance thermometers? What we do is calibrate them at a number of known temperatures. You're probably familiar with the idea that ice melts at zero degrees Celsius and that water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. These are fixed points. Anyone with water can achieve a temperature of zero or 100 degrees Celsius by boiling or freezing. But the problem with using zero Celsius and 100 Celsius as fixed points is that they're not completely fixed. As the weather changes, atmospheric pressure changes and this causes changes to the temperature at which water freezes and melts and the temperature at which it boils. So making an experiment on one day you won't get quite the same result as you would on another day. To overcome this we use so-called fixed point cells. Changes in atmospheric pressure don't make a difference. This is called a triple point cell. Inside it is pure water. The small volume above the water contains no air. The air has been removed, so there's only water vapor in that space. You can see that it behaves quite differently. If I turn it upside down, you can hear it make a clunk as the water descends on the bottom. There's no air in there to stop the water as it falls. In use, what we do is freeze this cell so that we have water and ice and water vapour above it. And the temperature of the cell in that condition is, is defined to be exactly 0 0.01 Celsius. Let me show you. Around the centre of this cell is ice, but you can see that the top has still got liquid water in it and we still have water vapour in the gap at the top. So all three phases of water, water vapour, liquid water and solid water, are present together. 
and the temperature inside here is 0 0.01 Celsius exactly. This is the starting point for all our calibrations. All our thermometers are placed inside this cell and their value noted at 0 0.1, 0 0.01 Celsius. Then we measure their resistance at some other fixed points. In this cell we have liquid mercury. When we freeze it around the thermometer its temperature is very precisely known. In this one we use aluminium and heat it in a furnace. As it freezes around the thermometer again its temperature is known exactly. This is an example of what's inside this cell. You can see the gap where the thermometer is placed. This is one that was broken so I can open it up for you and you can see that surrounding the well in the center is the place where the metal is. When it's heated up that's molten and it's frozen slowly around the thermometer and the temperature at which it freezes can be noted. So those are the fixed points but I can hear you say again how did people work out what the temperature of those fixed points was? To understand this we need to go back to the very basic understanding of what temperature is. Everything in the world is made up out of atoms and molecules and they're constantly moving and temperature is a measure of the average energy, the average kinetic energy with which they move. The simplest form of matter to understand is a gas. If we trap a gas in a known volume then as the temperature increases so does the, sp the speed of the molecules increases and the force with which they hit the walls increases which we measure as an increase in pressure. So by measuring the pressure of a trapped gas we can infer the temperature directly. I've got something here which works on that principle. Inside this volume is a known amount of gas. As the temperature of this volume increases the pressure increases and this pressure is communicated down this pipe and indicated on a dial. This one isn't very accurate but working very hard over years scientists have used exactly this principle to calibrate the temperatures at which these fixed points freeze and melt. In order to work out temperature from first principles Previously, people have used apparatus a bit like this, in which there's a known amount of gas trapped in a fixed volume. By measuring the pressure of the gas, they could work out the temperature. At MPL, I'm working on a new technique for doing this a little bit more precisely. Unlike previous experiments on gases which fixed the volume and then worked out the temperature by measuring changes in pressure, in this experiment we fix the pressure and allow the gas to expand. Then by measuring changes in density we can work out the temperature. We measure the changes in density by shining a bright laser light through the gas. When the gas is very dense it glows brightly in the laser beam. When the gas is less dense it glows less brightly and by measuring these brightness changes we can infer density changes and so measure the temperature. The laser beam travels through a tube filled with ultra pure argon gas. Around this region of the tube we have a cell which cools it to close to the triple point of water so we know the temperature here. Around this region of the tube we have another cell in which we can change the temperature and by measuring the brightness with which the laser causes the gas to glow in this region we can work out the true temperature. I used to be a lecturer in physics and I still love physics and it was very hard to leave but the thing that I really like about this job over what I was doing previously was that all the work we do really has somebody who wants it done. Somebody pays for this work because they really want to know the answer. And I really enjoy that about the work. It keeps, pe keeps people, keeps me very focused. Also there's 
lots of people at MPL who try to help me. It's, it's just so nice. Around five years ago, a terrible thing happened to me and I turned 40 years old. And I realized I wasn't happy doing what I was doing. And so I looked around and NPL offered me a job. It's not like university. Although lecturers are your colleagues, in a way they're also your competitors. And that's not really true here. I've been working on this project for about five years, but not all the time. Customers have come and needed things doing and I've had to go off and do things for a year and come back to it. So this is a very long-term project that I've put a lot of energy into. Every nut and bolt in this apparatus, I've tightened it myself. And it's lovely to be able to devote yourself to something over that length of time. And very soon, very soon, it's going to be working perfectly. One of the good things about MPL is that they encourage their scientists to go out and talk to people in the community. So I work as a science ambassador. That means I can go into schools and splash liquid nitrogen around, play with solid carbon dioxide and boil things, heat things, use magnets, do all kinds of fun things that teachers can't do.